Hello, everyone. My name is Michel. Thank you very much for joining us today to listen to Professor Baz Bloom on the topic of which type of exercise is best for people like us, people with Parkinson's. Today's session has attracted an unprecedented level of interest. And this is no surprise, given that exercise is a critical tool for people with Parkinson's to manage their symptoms. It's also no surprise, given the privilege that we have today to listen to Professor Bloom, one of the world's leading experts on Parkinson's disease. I would like to remind everyone that this session is for information and education purposes only. So if you are seeking medical advice, diagnosis or treatment, or if you are simply unsure as to which type of exercise is suitable to your own medical condition, you should then really consult a medical professional. There will be time for questions at the end of this presentation. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Please do not use the chat function for questions as we will not see them. For those of you who don't know us yet, No Silver Bullet is a Parkinson's support group managed by Mark Lambert and myself. Our aim is to help people with Parkinson's become, become well-informed generalists in their condition and help them manage their symptoms actively. And to that end, we've been hosting fascinating speakers like tonight every few weeks. We post the recordings of our sessions on YouTube and recently now on Spotify. If you exercise, you can listen to Spotify. And I invite you to subscribe to those channels so that you're informed when we post new content. The details are available, will be made available by Mark in a second in the chat section at the bottom of your screen. But let's come back to today's topic and to Professor Bloom, who will share with us the key findings from his research on the benefits of physical activity on general health and motor functioning in people with Parkinson's. Professor Bloom is consultant neurologist at the Department of Neurology at the Radboud University Medical Center in the Netherlands. He's without a doubt one of the world's top Parkinson's specialists. And through his effort with Parkinson Net, people with Parkinson's in the Netherlands and in a, no a growing number of other countries are able to much more easily access specialized care. Professor Bloom was also recently awarded a prestigious Stevin Premi Award, which is the highest scientific prize in the Netherlands. So Professor Bloom, congratulations. We are extremely fortunate to have you with us tonight and the stage is now yours. Thank you so much for the uh, very kind introduction. Let me start sharing the screen here with sound. There you go. So can you confirm that you can see, let me see, put it on presentation. Can you, yes. can, yes, can you see perfect. it well? We can see it perfectly well. Okay, that is excellent. So, and you can still see me somewhere in the background or can you we just- We can see, see you on the side. We have the whole, the whole month, the full month. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much again for the kind introduction. So yes, I, I, I received this extremely prestigious award in the Netherlands, which in my country has been named the Dutch Nobel Prize for Science. It's incredible. And it's, it actually happens to be here on my, this is the bronze statue that comes with it. It's called the Stevin Award. And Stevin was a famous scientist in uh, the 17th century who was a physician uh, uh, and uh, uh, a physicist and a mathematician and a genius. So it's an incredible honor to have received this award. So today we're talking about um, um, uh, a lifestyle exercise and lifestyle interventions. Um, my main disclosure is that um, according to a, a geneticist in my hospital, I am um, the unofficial carrier of a mutation in the gene for optimism. Um, and I am very hopeful that during my lifetime and during my active career, we will make substantial improvements in the way we help and support families with Parkinson's uh, to create a better future for, for all of you. And my other main disclosure is that I'm a former athlete. So one reason why I'm so excited to study exercise uh, is that I was part of the Dutch national volleyball team under 18. And what always gives me great pride to show is that this is Henk Jan Held, who won Olympic gold in 1998, uh, I believe it was, in, in Atlanta. Uh, Olaf van der Meulen, another gold medalist. Ron Zwerver, another gold medalist. And that's me uh, at the age of 18. Uh, but I, uh, whereas they went on to win Olympic gold, I went on to become a doctor and uh, with a focus on Parkinson's disease. But you can see that I'm still very why I'm still very passionate about exercise. Uh, there's a lot to tell you, and I have a lot to share with you today, so please bear with me. Uh, there are now over 2,000 papers 
on Parkinson's and exercise, and the number keeps increasing uh, by the day. What is good news for all of you is that there are currently 137 trials ongoing to further develop an evidence base for exercise. I think all of us believe that exercise is good. Um, I will show you a lot of new evidence that exercise is indeed actually good, but more evidence is underway. And why is this important? Well, if not for anything else, to persuade the payers and the hospitals to reimburse exercise as a medicine, uh, to persuade your medical team to prescribe exercise as a drug, as a therapy, um, uh, and to motivate fellow patients uh, to regularly engage in exercise. So this is all good news. I just wanted to mention this book called Sweat by Billy Hayes. Um, and uh, uh, Billy Hayes uh, 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 is a, a, an avid exerciser uh, himself. He's the uh, spouse of the late Oliver Sacks. Uh, and it's a brilliant book that I really enjoyed reading. And I will quote here and there uh, from this book. Uh, one thing from the book that I thought was really interesting is we talk about exercise as, as if it is something new. But what Bill Hayes in his book describes is that in Olympia, and you see the images of the uh, beautiful antique Olympia here, in those days, exercise was very common. And um, exercise uh, was derived from the Latin word exercitatio, uh, free from restraint to allow unbridled activity. Uh, interestingly enough, it also includes mental exercise, including good manners. It was initially deployed for animals to make them fitter, uh, but it was later used particularly, of course, by the Spartacans uh, to better prepare for war. And exercise is all about the intention. It's the intention, the explicit intention to stay healthy and to prevent disease. So if you go from A to B, that is called transportation. If you compete, it's sports. That's different from exercise. And for those of you who are in the gym looking in the mirror all the time, it's not to improve your own beauty, that is called vanity. Um, so we're talking today about exercise. And he also describes how miraculously exercise disappeared from the, uh, uh, from the scene until the 17th century when this gentleman called Girolamo Mercuriale uh, brought, brought exercise back to the fore, um, which is really interesting. Um, uh, uh, he was a physician um, that wrote this book uh, about exercise, emphasizing why it is so incredibly important. And he describes a definition of exercise as a physical movement that is vigorous and spontaneous. It involves a changing breathing pattern and is undertaken with the aim of keeping healthy or building up a sound constitution. The breathing pattern is really interesting because patients with Parkinson's have, and I should say persons with Parkinson's, and I apologize every time I speak about patient, that is slip of the tongue. I hate the word patient. You are persons, you are not patients. Um, um, but persons with Parkinson's um, have a difficulty cranking up their heart rate above 100. This is not something you should worry about. It's because the autonomic nervous system that is sending a nerve signal to the heart is also part of the disease process. So it means that tailoring your exercise to your heart rate can be very frustrating. Uh, and, and you should really tailor your exercise to your breathing pattern. So I always tell my patients, when you are panting, but still able to maintain a conversation, uh, that is just about the right dose. And Mercuriale in the 17th century already uh, acknowledged that. And I increasingly feel, I, you know, I'm a sports buff myself still. I increasingly feel that exercise and sports are very similar to having Parkinson's. This is an image from um, the, 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 the Tour of uh, Flanders, uh, a famous cycling event in, in Europe, in Belgium, where the guy on the left, Mathieu van der Poel, a Dutch guy, beats the guy on the right, uh, in yellow, uh, Wout van Aert, by, by just by, by, by a fraction of an inch. And the difference between winning or losing among elite athletes 
is because everything needs to be right. Your bicycle, your diet, your sleep, your stress levels. And this is exactly what you guys and girls uh, need to do. Parkinson's is like being a elite athlete. Everything needs to be right. Your bowel movements, your sleep, your regular exercise, your diet, your stress levels. I will only be talking about exercise today, but all of this needs to be well. Um, it includes your diet and it includes stress levels. And we can have separate conversations around diet and stress uh, if you invite me for other silver bullets later on, but we'll talk about exercise today. And why is it important to increase your physical activities? Well, for one, if not for anything else, there are generic health benefits. Exercise is good for your bone health. It reduces the risk of dementia. It's good for your heart. It's good for your lungs. It's good for your muscles. This is all well established. There is now good evidence, and I will show you some findings, that exercise, physical activities, help to suppress motor symptoms, as well as a number of non-motor symptoms. So like a drug, they alleviate symptoms. There is some very exciting new evidence to suggest that maybe, maybe regular exercise could slow down disease progression. And if it can slow down disease progression in those who already have Parkinson's, who knows, who knows, it might prevent Parkinson's altogether or delay the manifestation in those at risk of developing Parkinson's. That's an area of research. And again, I'll come to that later on. There are some interesting new insights into the working mechanisms uh, behind exercise. And I'm giving to, that to you first because it may motivate you even further to regularly engage in exercise. So on the one hand, exercise is still pretty much a black box. And by a black box, I mean, we know what goes in, running on a treadmill for 45 minutes. We know what comes out, better health. What mediates the effects of exercise is in many ways relatively poorly understood. There are many papers that have discussed uh, in good journals that have discussed how and why exercise should work. And this is a difficult cartoon and I understand, but it's just to show you that there are many ideas and thoughts and also scientific evidences to support the merits of exercise. It may work through enhancing the blood flow through the brain, just simply more blood in your brain. It may work by driving adaptive plastic changes in functional connectivity in the brain. It may stimulate the release of growth factors. It may stimulate the release of dopamine. So there's all sorts of working mechanisms. But I just wanted to highlight one very recent study, and I truly urge you to fasten your seatbelts about what you're about to hear now. This is a brand new study published in Nature earlier this year, and it was done not for Parkinson's, but for Alzheimer's disease. So keep that in mind, but I'll come to Parkinson's in a minute. This is the paper published in, uh, in Nature, which as you know, is one of the elite journals on the planet. And what they did in this study is take mice and half of the mice were forced to exercise on a daily basis by running in a treadmill. The other mice, were just left in their cage and did nothing. They were just sedentary rodents. And what they then did is do a blood transfusion of the sedentary mice and also the exercising mice into a third new group of mice who had been sedentary themselves, lazy mice. So lazy mice receiving the blood from active mice or receiving the blood from other lazy mice. And lo and behold, they were able to convey the benefits of exercise through a blood transfusion. Isn't that totally fascinating? And they were able to identify from blood that the active ingredient was a compound called clusterin. And clusterin is an anti-inflammatory protein in your blood. So maybe one of the reasons why exercise benefits the brain is that it may suppress inflammatory processes 
in the brain. And we now know that inflammation is probably part of the pathophysiology that's leading to Parkinson's disease. So in an editorial that we published in the Journal of Parkinson's Disease, we speculate that the same compound clusterin may affect and inhibit neuroinflammation in people with Parkinson's who regularly exercise. I think that is really exciting. What I do not want you to remember is that you should hope for a blood transfusion of somebody else who's done your workout. Please exercise yourself. So this man is dreaming of a six pack through blood transfusion, but that's not gonna work. You'll have to do this yourself. So one take home message here is that we are beginning to build a reasonable understanding of why exercise might benefit persons with Parkinson's disease. So what about the efficacy then? Um, I will show you one brief video, which I always like to show. This is by Nicolas Koukoulakis, who friended me on Facebook. He is a wonderful man who is a former European champion in weightlifting. And he shared this beautiful video, uh, which is wonderful for a variety of reasons. This is him at home with freezing of gait, which you know, as many of you know, will recognize, is this is more uh, uh, difficult in a crowded environment, but he can climb stairs um, as a compensatory strategy. He can ride a bicycle, um, which is why cycling is such a good exercise for Parkinson patients. But the moment he dismounts, he's stuck and frozen again. Um, and, uh, but he's still an avid exerciser, uh, as you can see here. And what I find really encouraging is that, look at this, he can barely walk, but after exercise, he can walk normally. And look, at the end, isn't that really encouraging and amazing? Now, what is important is that he feels an improvement immediately after exercise. And I have to admit, I'm showing this video because it is so motivating. Most people who exercise feel fatigued after exercise, and they may feel a worsening of their symptoms. Please, please, please don't take this as evidence that exercise is bad for you. It's a medal for good behavior because it drives adaptive processes in your body that help to counter your Parkinson's. So yes, you may feel extra tired after exercise. Your tremor may be worse, your walking, your gait may be more difficult, but that's a sign that you've done a proper exercise and your workout will drive adaptive changes in your body. If you feel excessively fatigued after exercise, take extra medication prior to exercise. Just in the minutes in the lead up to my talk, I saw the first question in the chat, which I already answered, is it's best to exercise in an on state rather than in an off state, because it allows you to get a better workout and to also combat the fatigue that may happen after exercise. And if you're on a regular regime of medication with the same dose at different times of the day, nothing keeps you from taking extra medication prior to exercise to allow you to engage in that decent workout. So I hope I don't repeat myself, but this is so close to my heart. If you're tired after exercise, if your symptoms worsen, it's not damaging your brain, it's not deleterious, the opposite is true. And please remember that. So this is a review paper published by my group where we looked at um, the benefits of aerobic exercise for people with Parkinson's. And what you see here is a complex slide, but I'll walk you through it. These are all different studies that looked at fitness. VO2 max on the left top, is a measure of physical fitness. And when you sum up all the different studies, you have this little uh, diamond here at the bottom. And if it is to the right of the zero line, it means there's a benefit. So exercise in all these studies taken together leads to greater physical fitness. So that's good. This is an even busier slide, but I'll walk you through it. This is the unified Parkinson's disease rating scale in the on state. And the on state and the UPDRS is the scale used by physicians like myself to score the severity of your Parkinson's symptoms. And again, a number of studies have looked at the benefits of exercise 
on the motor symptoms of Parkinson's, according to the UPDRS. And there is a tendency for improvement. In this case, a negative score means improvement because there are fewer symptoms. That's why it's a negative score. But you see that the diamond is overlapping with the zero line, meaning it is a tendency, but it's not statistically significant. But if you look at the UPDRS score measured in the off state when the medication is not working, now there is a significant benefit of exercise. So you should do your exercise when you are on, but you will experience the greatest benefits when you are off. Does it make sense? I hope so, uh, which is nice because it means that exercise suppresses your symptoms at a time when the medication isn't working well, which is when you need it most. Other studies looked at um, different lifestyle factors and, and, and Parkinson's, and they looked in this case at disease progression and even mortality. And in this particular study, which was a very nice study, they found that several factors um, helped to slow down progression and reduce mortality. It was regular coffee intake, which is really fascinating, not for today, but coffee seems to protect against Parkinson's, but it may also slow down disease progression, moderate alcohol consumption, engaging in competitive sports, and engaging in regular physical activity. They did not look at dietary intake in further detail. What is bad for you is smoking. So as you may know, a number of studies have shown that people who smoke regularly during life have a lower risk of developing Parkinson's disease. And some people have taken this as evidence that they should start to smoke. Don't ever, ever, ever do that. Smoking leads to heart disease, cancer, whatnot. And this study shows that if you already have Parkinson's and you still smoke, it worsens your Parkinson's and it increases your risk of death and so does heavy alcohol consumption. So these are things that you can start to do tomorrow yourself. Another study, which was even better designed, was published this year in JAMA Open Network by uh, Michael Schwarzschild, my good friend from uh, Harvard in Boston. And basically, and again, this is a busy slide, but look at the two red squares. If you, engage in regular physical activity, the risk of dying from Parkinson's or dying with Parkinson's is significantly lower uh, if, you, uh, if you're regularly physically acti active. And the upper square is for regular physical activity in the time prior to your diagnosis. But the bottom red square is for regular physical activity after you acquired the diagnosis. So engaging in physical activity is better for your future if you do that prior to Parkinson's, but also after you've acquired Parkinson's. They also looked at a Mediterranean diet and the Mediterranean diet was also good in determining your prognosis. So a good diet, Mediterranean diet and exercise together are good for you. And this is the summary, a lower mortality, associated with more physical activity. And in practical terms, it's about 10 to 20 hours of walking per day, or about five to nine hours of moderate intensity activities per week, as well as a healthier diet. And it applied to both pre and post diagnostic. Interestingly, there was no interaction effect suggesting that diet and exercise are independent, separate effects that will both benefit you. So I hope that encourages you to uh, take your own responsibility and eat well and exercise well. Um, so, yeah, this is basically summarizing what I've just said. And this comes again from the book by um, um, uh, Billy Hayes. Um, it's so interesting that we're now seeing this sort of a dual effect of exercise and diet. And Hippocrates, the founding father of modern medicine, already said this. Uh, hundreds of years uh, before Christ. So makes us humble, doesn't it? Um, but we forgot all about these um, good advices. So which components of exercise? This is something that um, uh, Michelle and Mark specifically asked me to talk about. It really doesn't matter what you do, 
as long as you do it. That's, that's the short message. There is now evidence, both from just daily life, but also from trials that, for example, boxing is good. Ping pong, I know that there are ping pong fans uh, today. Uh, I'm a great fan of ping pong. I, I love to play ping pong myself. There are ping pong tournaments. There's even a world championship of ping pong. So ping pong is really good. Um, cycling is really good. This is our annual cycling event in the Netherlands where the, the other man, I'm on the right and the man on the left is somebody with Parkinson's who was actually a way better cyclist uh, than I was. So uh, uh, cycling uh, is good. Uh, this is a marathon runner. Um, you can see that he has no arm swing, so he's got Parkinson's disease, but he runs marathons with Parkinson's, um, even though regular walking is difficult. Uh, running marathons is still possible. And what I find really wonderful is that together with two other Parkinson patients, they now do a triathlon. So one of the guys is swimming, the other guy is cycling, and the third guy is running, and together they do a triathlon. Now that's Goosebumps and real teamwork, and I really like that. Uh, this is basketball. Uh, this is somebody with Parkinson's from Italy. Uh, my good friend Alfonso Fasano gave me that video. You see that gait is uh, disturbed. Um, there's a markedly reduced arm swing. Um, uh, but look at him with a basketball. Market improvement in the quality of the movements. He was a former professional basketball player, and uh, well, I can't do that. I can tell you that. Uh, and this is dancing. This is in the north of the Netherlands, beautiful dancing group, where this young girl touches all these people, mimicking, mimicking the stooped posture of Parkinson's. They actually, all of them have Parkinson's, and they all open up like flowers. It gives me the goosebumps every time I see it. And people are dancing even when they are wheelchair bound. And there's now good scientific evidence to show the merits of dance as a therapy for Parkinson's patients. So this is a recent editorial that we published uh, in JAMA Neurology, which is one of our lead journals. Uh, again, going back to ancient uh, uh, Rome and ancient Greece under the title Sitius Fortius Altius, the motto of the Olympic Games. And we opened a debate as to what component of exercise is best. So it doesn't really matter whether it's volleyball or basketball or ping pong or you know swimming. But what is what is the component? And um, Hesiod, the famous Greek poet, said, "The immortal gods have made it so. To achieve excellence, we must first sweat." And like I said, the the the, the Greeks got it right. So yes, the sweat component is important. Uh, it's one of the drivers, and this is a beautiful study uh, by Margaret Schenkman and the senior author is Daniel Korkos, uh, two wonderful scientists from the United States who are leading very important exercise studies uh, in the United States. Uh, they were the first to really study um, the dose of exercise and the benefits for people with Parkinson's. And what they did is they had three groups. One was not doing any exercise. One group was motivated to crank up their heart rate while running on a treadmill to 60 to 65% of their maximum heart rate. And another group was motivated to crank up their heart rate to 80 or 85% of their maximum. And the dark dots is the high intensity group. And as you can see, they faithfully complied. They, and the, the, the open circles, is the low intensity group. And also they faithfully complied with what they were instructed to do. And this is the clinical outcome. What you see at the y-axis is the difference in the UPDRS motor score. So a zero line means no difference. Positive scores uh, mean um, uh, a worsening. And what you see on the right for usual care is that the square is above zero. So the control people not exercising were worsening over time. There was less worsening in the low intensity group and there was clinical stabilization in the high intensity group. Isn't that cool? So the higher the intensity, the greater the benefit of exercise. 
So low intensity is better than nothing, but high intensity is better than a low intensity. I hope that's clear. So the dose of exercise matters. And this is the sweat component. Sweating matters. But Plato, again, going back to the ancient Greeks, Plato said it's not the number of exercises, but their moderate nature that brings about a good human constitution. And Plato, 400 BC, was also right. I mean, isn't that amazing? These, these ancient Greeks, silly guys, but wonderful. So there are now two papers to show that in addition to the aerobic, to the sweat component, the simple, the sheer volume of activities is also important. This is one of two papers. And what they looked here is, again, dying with Parkinson's as the outcome measure. And they looked not at the intensity of exercise, but the volume of exercise. So taking 10,000 steps per day at a leisure pace versus 5,000 steps at a leisure pace per day. And what they showed, as shown here, is that people with a lot of exercise or, or a, a greater volume of activities had a lower risk of dying with Parkinson's than those who were inactive. So this study shows that in addition to the sweat component, simply doing more, even if it's at a leisure pace, is also helpful. And I find that highly encouraging. And that was confirmed by this study done in Japan, um, where they also looked at the volume of physical activities. What you can see here in the blue line is controls who maintained their level of physical activity. The PACE score on the y-axis is a scale for physical activity. Healthy people remain active at a stable level for about a six-year period, where people with Parkinson's became less and less active over time. And we know that this is happening. So that's one finding. But what they also showed is that people who did more, shown in the left cartoon in, uh, uh, in red, declined slower over time than people with low levels of physical activity. So again, this study showed that a greater volume of activities is helping you to slow down disease progression. And on the right, uh, it's um, activities of daily living. And these decline faster in people with little physical activities compared to people with high physical activities shown in red. So two independent studies from different parts of the world showing that in addition to sweat, just doing simply more is helpful. Uh, and Thomas Jefferson, famous American president, said, no less than two hours a day should be devoted to exercise. And I like this quote. And the weather shall be little regarded. Isn't that wonderful? No excuses for you. If the body is feeble, the mind will not be strong. So your take-home message here is that the drivers of exercise uh, include the intensity but also the volume. And these appear to be two independent drivers. So bear that in mind. Now, now we go to something really cool and exciting. These are Dutch snacks. And I tell you, boy, these are really, really good. Um, the, uh, the round ones are my favorites. They're called uh, bitterballen for the Dutch, bitterballs. Uh, but these are really good. They're, and they're not particularly healthy, uh, but they're good. And these are obviously snacks. And what is so really interesting is there is now novel work from California to show that exercise snacks are also helpful. So what we always tell our patients is you should exercise three times a week for 30 minutes. And many people say, oh, hecky darn, when can I free up 30 consecutive minutes? to do my exercise. The latest research is now showing that if you do an exercise for one minute and an hour later, you do another one minute, it all adds up. So 30 times a snack of one minute is as good as one block of 30 minutes. And I call this exercise snacks 
So instead of taking the elevator, you climb the stairs and you've got your snack. And taken together, you should reach 150 of those snacks per week, which is just over 20 per day. Now that's suddenly quite doable. People think, oh, where do I find 30 consecutive minutes? Treat yourself with exercise snacks. And there is now actually evidence, this is published work on exercise snacks, that it also helps for bone health, cardiac health, etc. So think about snacks. These may be helpful. And I find that a very powerful message. So this is one of my uh, uh, interesting studies where I participated, and where we looked at um, making the exercise a bit more complex. And what we did in this study is put people on a treadmill, the aerobic exercise, and we tried to combine it with virtual reality. And our thought was that a more complex intervention, both working out on the treadmill and being engaged, immersed in this complex 3D environment would be extra beneficial. So we compared people on a treadmill with just a treadmill to people on the same treadmill, but also with a virtual reality environment. I hope that makes sense. And what we show here is using falling as the primary outcome measure, that the uh, decline in falls happens in both groups. So both groups are better. So treadmill training helps to prevent falls, but the prevention of falls was greater in patients who combined treadmill training with virtual reality. So the more complex the intervention, the better it is. So that was an important message. And by the way, um, if you come to think of it, running outside is combining treadmill running with virtual reality. So maybe you should just run outside instead of indoors on the treadmill, but anyway. So multimodal interventions, both aerobic and a more cognitive demanding task are better than just aerobic exercise alone. So that's another interesting one. It was also an extremely frustrating study. And it was frustrating because we needed this complex and expensive equipment to train people. So they had to come to the hospital all the time to train and many people declined to participate. So this brings us to barriers and motivators for exercise, which I think is important to talk about today. What can we do to promote compliance so that people actually do what is good for you? And after all, many of us are lazy. We prefer a pill or deep brain stimulation over an active lifestyle. And I hope that after today, you are motivated to the bone to exercise more and to have a healthier diet. Um, and yes, exercise can be tough. This is again the genius Mercuriale in the 16th century. We in no way dispute that exercise can sometimes be hard and when it is being performed, unpleasant. But good health is not incompatible with some discomfort. Isn't that beautiful? No pain, no gain is the other phrase that I think the Americans are using. So we published a paper on barriers and motivators for exercise in persons with Parkinson's disease. And this is a complex slide, but again, I'll walk you through it. One key barrier by patients was, I feel the same whether or not I'm physically active. But I will show you in a number of studies that in fact your outcome six months down the line is better if you exercise. So no matter whether you notice it today, you will be better six months down the line if you exercise regularly. I have little time. Think about your snacks, no excuse. And a fear of falling prevents me from exercising. We've already seen that exercise actually prevents falls. And I will give you one other study in a minute to show that falling should not be one of your primary fears. Obviously, when you have a lot of freezing of gait, speak to your physiotherapist about an exercise that is safe for you. For example, cycling on a stationary bicycle. Um, but there are always exercises uh, with a low risk of falling. So this was an interesting study where we looked at 
motivation for exercise. It's a paper published in the British Medical Journal. And what we basically did is, I'm not sure if there's only Europeans or maybe Americans in the audience, but this is the famous Tom Brady, uh, the most famous quarterback in the United States. And even the famous Tom Brady needs a personal coach. And if you are a person with Parkinson's, I think you will benefit from having a coach who designs a personalized exercise intervention that is tailored to your abilities, your wishes, and your needs. So what we did in this trial is allocate coaches to persons with Parkinson's. They were either instructed to move more safely or to move more vigorously. So park safe versus park fit, but they both had a coach. I'm showing this study for one main reason. The eligible candidates, if you look at the right, were more often, so people who wanted to participate were particularly men. So women were less likely to enter our trial. The people interested to join were slightly younger. The people who were interested to join had a shorter disease duration. And importantly, the people who were already very active were interested to join an exercise study. Whereas people who were sedentary, who needed the exercise most, refused to be randomized. Isn't that interesting? So the folks on the left, the older ones, the ones with longer disease and the least active, did, want, did not want to go into my trial and they needed it most. So think for yourself if this applies to you. So we took this at heart in a, in a study that we published in the Lancet Neurology. This study was proclaimed as one of the 10 best studies in the entire Parkinson field uh, for the year 2019. And what we did here is we delivered a stationary bicycle into the patient's homes. Uh, you've seen the one patient, uh, the Greek weightlifter, unable to walk because of freezing, but still able to ride a bicycle. So we felt a bicycle was good because even people grounded by freezing can still ride a bicycle. Um, and you can't fall off the bicycle, un un unlike a treadmill. So this was good for a home-based intervention. And as you can see, there's a big screen. So it was a very fancy bicycle. And I'll tell you why. Um, because we we gamified the intervention. Do you recognize this famous lady from the United States? This is Alice Waters, a founding chef of Berkeley Chez Panisse. And she said, good health shouldn't be the goal of exercise. Make pleasure the goal, and it will lead to good health. So make sure you enjoy your exercise, and health will be the automatic and inevitable consequence of your exercise. I really like that quote. So we decided to gamify the intervention. And even elderly people, as you can see here, uh, are able to uh, enjoy a game or two. Um, and what we did is we built a customized app uh, on a tablet that motivated people to start exercising because they were given all sorts of anticipated rewards. We rewarded people during the exercise on the bicycle. For example, they were playing the Pac-Man game but the monsters were moving faster and faster. So you had to cycle faster and faster to kill the monsters. So in the end, the participant said, ah, I killed 10 monsters. But in effect, you had cycled at 40% uh, for 45 minutes at 80% cardiac output. And then we rewarded people after the exercise, for example, because there was applause by your fans. And um, this is the study design. Uh, people were either doing this aerobic exercise combined with a personal coach and this gamified app. And the control group had the exact same deal, but they were only doing stretching exercises. And this is a cool slide. Again, it's, it's maybe a bit complex, but I'll walk you through it. The instruction was to exercise for 26 weeks, three times a week for 30 minutes in your designated heart rate zone. HRZ is heart rate zone. Now, we talked about how difficult it is to regularly engage in exercise, how people always have an excuse not to exercise, how people see barriers. 
But thanks to these gamification elements, people did what they had to do and sometimes even more. So that was brilliant. The gamification worked. And what we, so we had excellent compliance with a home-based intervention with remote supervision by a coach and gamification elements uh, called extra gaming. But crucially, this is again the UPDRS, our scale for scoring Parkinson's symptoms on the y-axis. And it's a different score. So the zero line means no change. The control group in gray is above the zero line. Can you see that? Meaning that the controls got worse over time, which is what you would expect from Parkinson's because it is a progressive disease. And the people in green who were exercising stabilized. And the difference between the two groups was 4.2 points on the UPDRS, which is equivalent to the effect of a drug for Parkinson's. So three times a week on your bicycle, and you will stop your decline and have the effect that is equivalent to a drug. So now we have two studies, the Schenkman study, you know, with the study you may remember with the, with the dosing on the treadmill and our study to show that if you are not exercising, you will decline over time. But we now have two independent studies to show that you can stabilize your motor functioning through exercise. Isn't that really, really, really encouraging? And our latest findings, now really fasten your seat belts again. If you untie them, fasten your seat belts again. What we did in my study, and this is now published in the Annals of Neurology, we did brain scans before and after exercise in our cycling study. And we also did brain scans before and after stretching in the control group. And this was a structural MRI scan to look at how the brain looks like and also a functional MRI scan to see how the brain was working. And the results were stunning. We showed that the brain in the stretching group was shrinking a little bit. The medical term is called atrophy. The green box shows that it's below zero, meaning that the brain was shrinking in controls. And we stopped the shrinking from happening through exercise. How cool is this? And I did not bring a slide to show this, but the exercising patients, persons, had new functional connectivity between the diseased Parkinson brain areas and the healthy motor cortex. So if you are on your treadmill, if you are playing ping pong, if you are playing basketball, and you're no longer motivated to exercise, think about this study. Because while you're exercising, your brain is making new connections, which help you to stabilize your symptoms, which I think is extremely encouraging. And it reminds me of this study in rodents. It's an old video, but the mouse on the left is an exercising mouse that exercises every day. It's a Parkinsonian mouse. And the, the poor mouse at the other treadmill that's falling off all the time is a mouse that is allowed to stay sedentary and, and stay in his cage all day. This is rodent work from San Francisco, uh, sorry, Los Angeles, to show that not only do exercising mouse, mice with Parkinson's look a lot healthier, when they sacrificed the mice and looked at the brain, they found the exact same thing that we found with our scans in the patients. So there is now converging evidence from animal studies and human studies to show that exercise repairs your brain. I mean, isn't that wonderful? Now, you need to personalize your exercise. So again, it doesn't matter what you do, but do something that you like and that you are likely to stick with or change. You know, do hiking on day one, do swimming on day two, do cycling on day three, but do something that you like and that you will adhere to. I think it is really important to always listen to the individual. So extreme patient participation is important in designing your optimal personalized uh, exercise intervention.
I'll skip this one for now. And very importantly, do it so that it is close to your home. Um, so you don't have to go to the gym all the time, but there's a lot you can do in your own home environment. And our studies show that the closer to home the exercise, the more likely people are to stick to it. So this is why I'll be brief about this. We're now doing the stepwise study. Now, the stepwise study is a very cool study where we use a smartphone to deliver a gamified intervention to people with Parkinson's. Uh, so we use the smartphone to deliver an intervention, but also to measure the outcome of the study uh, remotely. Um, it's, a, it's like a Pokemon Go for the elderly. Does any one of you play Pokemon Go? It, uh, it changed my, uh, uh, my sons uh, uh, in, uh, in their puberty from, in, in, from inertia into really active disciples trying to catch all these monsters. So we, we took the uh, Pokemon Go experience and we've built a customized app for people with Parkinson's, which motivates them to exercise on a daily basis. The reward is not a monster as in Pokemon Go, but the reward is knowledge about exercise and insights. Uh, it's a dosing study. So we, we dose people with a little bit extra, uh, uh, a lot extra or a lot and a lot extra. So we are going to learn more about the dose of exercise, which is really cool. Uh, and we also measure the outcome with the same smartphone because you can hold the phone in your hands and measure tremor. You can tap on the screen and measure your slowness. You can speak to the phone and it analyzes your voice. It's a really cool uh, remote study. And this is my final slide. Um, because we are so convinced about the benefits of exercise, um, we are now taking this to the next level in the slow speed study. I just presented the design of the study last weekend in Boston, where we are using the same gamified intervention to people at risk of developing future Parkinson's. So these are people with a genetic risk or people with the first prodromal symptoms like a REM sleep behavior disorder, and they will be randomized to either do nothing or to exercise regularly. And we want to show that we can actually postpone Parkinson's by engaging in regular exercise. So that's it folks. Um, I will stop the, um, the share. Oop. and uh, we'll open it up for debate, no doubt. Thank you very much, Professor Bloom. This is an amazing presentation. I think that it's uh, far more uplifting than what I even imagined, and I imagined already quite a lot. Um, if it wasn't so late in London, I would probably go for a run right now. But thank you very much for this. Um, I know you're extremely familiar with Zoom. Do you want to go through the questions in the Q&A section yourself? I know you've started answering some that might be more efficient than me reading them over to you. Sure. So, uh, Sagit Weiss, um, it says, what kind of food or su food supplement do you recommend to support um, people and maintain muscle? Um, so um, food and muscle is, is difficult. Um, that's not been studied specifically for Parkinson's. I, um, uh, what I did not emphasize today yet is that in addition to aerobic exercise and to the volume of activities, strength training is also important. So Saget, it's important that you raise this issue uh, because people with Parkinson's are at risk of developing weakness in their muscles, which may then jeopardize your balance. For example, when you try to get out of bed or when you try to get out of a chair. So strength training is important. Uh, there's very little evidence specifically from the Parkinson field um, what dietary components are helpful. Um, what is important is that many people with Parkinson's are cautioned against the use of proteins because these may, may in, in your food, because these may, may interfere with levodopa, but at the same time, you need to see the same proteins for your muscles. So try to avoid simultaneous intake of levodopa with proteins. Make sure that you spread your proteins across the day and probably an adequate dose of proteins is needed to build up a sufficient muscle mass in addition to strength training. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Um, Audrey Boyle uh, says, what level of exercise will result in release of BDNF? And for the listeners, that is brain-derived neural growth factor. In those that find exercising difficult, 
or have injury. Um, so this 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 relates to the question, you know, what to do in general. So 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 set, setting aside all these growth factors or other mediators of exercise, what can I do when I find it difficult to exercise? Well, hopefully, if you've listened to my talk today, brief bouts of exercise are already helpful. That's one. Simply walking a little bit more is also helpful. If you have difficulty walking, consider a treadmill, uh, sorry, or, or consider a, a bicycle. Uh, if that is even impossible, there are hand bicycles. Um, or speak to your therapist about a seated bicycle where you sit in your own comfy chair where you can just pedal with your legs. Um, strength training can often be done even with light weights. So if you find it difficult, to exercise, go see a physical therapist or a sports trainer. And when you sit down and look at your abilities, I realize it can be challenging for some, but my experience is there's always something to be found and build it up. So you don't have to run a marathon right away. Start small, think big, act fast. So start small and reward yourself with a little bit extra the next day. Athletes don't run marathons right away. If you've got Parkinson's, build it up. Start small, but think big. Um, Sue Vandel says, I have sinus tachycardia, so my heart rate is normally higher than average. Does this affect the heart rate I should be seeking while exercising? Well, Sue, what I did not address in the end is the fact that people with Parkinson's have a slightly higher risk of cardiovascular complications. Um, and I think anyone listening, and the reason is that because of physical inactivity, we have a slightly higher risk of atherosclerosis, but levodopa, which is interesting, increases the risk also of atherosclerosis. So a number of studies have shown that people with Parkinson's have a slightly higher risk of strokes in the brain and heart attacks. Um, now that's a small risk. and Most people can just normally exercise. If in slightest doubt, I would recommend doing an exercise test prior to building up your uh, aerobic workout, just to be on the safe side. We've done that in our trials. Nearly everyone was safe, but one or two uh, had a cardiac issue that required attention before they could engage in exercise. And for example, I'm not a cardiologist, but I can see how a sinus tachycardia uh, might be a reason to see an exercise expert, or maybe a cardiologist, and ask about your right dose of exercise. Um, Harley Stanton says, can you provide the specific references for the published articles? And yes, uh, Mark and Michelle and I will communicate and we will send PDFs of the relevant papers so you can uh, read that. Um, Audrey Boyle says, should I take up moderate drinking to slow progression if I don't drink? That is a very good question. My sincere advice would be, I think the benefits of alcohol are grossly overestimated. I think we all want alcohol so desperately to be good that we are ignoring the bad studies and highlighting the good studies. I personally think that if you think of brain atrophy, liver toxicity, muscle wasting, alcohol is in general not good. If you enjoy alcohol, these studies show that you shouldn't be all that fearful. If you do alcohol, enjoy it, drink it with pleasure, but do it modestly. One, maximally two consumptions and not every day. And if you don't drink, I would never recommend picking up drinking now as a therapy. Um, Ali says, I've heard sport climbing is also good. Yes, there was a recent study uh, from Austria, from actually uh, one of my PhD students, um, uh, Heidi Zach, who's done wonderful work on sport climbing. And uh, yes, they are showing some very favorable results. Holland is flat as a pancake. There's nothing to be climbed here other than the stairs. But if you live in a country with, with climbing, definitely there is some research to show the benefits now. Um, Grant says, was there a follow-up on the study five years later? That's an excellent question, Grant. And one major limitation in uh, these prospective studies that I mentioned is that the follow-up was only six months. Um, and then, the, then we ran out of money. 
Uh, I mean, imagine these are 1 million euro trials. These are costly, difficult, expensive studies. And yes, we need long-term follow-up studies uh, that needs to be done. Uh, obviously, the epidemiological work, which is retrospective studies looking at existing data, they span decades. Uh, they show that engaging in exercise for longer periods of time is beneficial. But the proof of the pudding ultimately comes from prospective studies. And yes, we need more long-term studies. These are now underway. I told you about the 137 ongoing studies. But so far, we are stuck with relatively short-term studies. These are positive and, and encouraging. But yes, we need long-term work. Um, how does the lower heart rate of people with Parkinson's affect the maximum heart rate for proper exercises? This is Thomas Brown. So Thomas, uh, it's, it, it's not a, a different uh, resting heart rate, but what people with, but some people with Parkinson's have difficulty with is increasing their heart rate above 100. So your resting heart rate is probably identical, but when you start to exercise, normally your heart rate goes up and what people typically do is they will encourage you to bring your heart rate to 120, 130, to maybe up to 160. And that may be difficult for people with Parkinson's because the nerve going to the heart is affected. It's not dangerous. It's nothing to worry about. But it means that when your heart rate plateaus, you are one of those folks where the nerve isn't working well. And you should tailor your exercise to your breathing pattern other than to your heart rate. Uh, even though many of the studies that I mentioned were actually using heart rate to monitor uh, the exercise intervention. But I think breathing is a lot easier. An anonymous attendee says, since developing PD, I don't sweat much at all. Will that negatively affect the impact of my high intensity activity? Well, that's a brilliant question. Uh, thank you for asking. I'm actually hoping that Michelle and Mark are taking minutes so that I can address some of these in my future uh, uh, lectures. Yes, sweating can be affected by Parkinson's and quite mysteriously, it can go both ways. There are people with prof diffuse, profuse, excessive sweating, and there are people who cannot sweat anymore. Uh, we published a case report by somebody who was unable to sweat because uh, this lady in fact had multiple system atrophy and developed a heat stroke accordingly. Uh, and sweating is a mechanism to um, get rid of body heat. Um, so yes, probably this will affect your ability to uh, um, engage in very vigorous exercise. I don't think any studies have been done. It's the first time I've heard the question. I think it's a really good question and I would recommend you to go see a therapist and um, just work with a therapist on a treadmill in controlled circumstances where there is cooling nearby, etc., to find your individual uh, right dose. Audrey Boyle, again, um, most persons with Parkinson's can't run uh, or do uh, high intensity training. Uh, what about them? Well, Audrey, I disagree that most people can't run. Many people have difficulty walking. The strange thing is that many people can run. Um, uh, even when they can't walk. So running on a treadmill is surprisingly often possible. Cycling on a home trainer is possible for the large majority of patients. And as I indicated before, it doesn't have to be high intensity training. The volume of activities is also important. Um, so brief bouts of exercise are good. Um, uh, and uh, prolonged exercise at a low intensity is also very good. So if you have listened carefully to the whole recipe, I think there's something to be gained uh, for every person with Parkinson's. So Sharon Maplethorpe says, why is an exercise program like PD Warrior so highly recommended as it has minimal cardio element and focuses on power and amplitude and not speed? Well, you know, I think this is good advertising. Um, PD Warrior is, uh, I'm not saying it's bad, it's probably good, uh, but I agree that um, uh, the focus should primarily be on the aerobic component and the exercise volume component. Yes, as we said earlier, uh, uh, strength training is also important. Um, PD Warrior does a great job in raising awareness for their program. 
it, it's probably a good program, but it's not the only program. Maybe that's the, the main point uh, that I'm making here. And don't forget about the aerobic component and or the volume component. Fiona McKenzie says, I've had rheumatoid arthritis for 30 years, fibromyalgia, and having had both patella removed, my knees need careful use. Well, I can imagine. Uh, Park so the patella is the, is the knee pads. Uh, Parkinson's diagnosed this year. I like exercise, but pain from non-Parkinson sources makes it hard. Is anyone researching exercise for people who start out with difficulties in exercising already? Now, yes, Fiona, this I can see how that might be an issue, but for example, I mentioned the hand bicycle. So if your legs are hurting during exercise, a hand bicycle uh, can allow you to do a, a workout without any strain on your legs or your knees. So there is always something that can be done. And I would seriously consider doing a, a hand bicycle. Uh, Sharon Maplethorpe, uh, how is it possible to incorporate strength, balance, cardio, stretching exercises, all elements that are recommended in only 30 minutes, three times a week? This is a good question, Sharon. And yes, this is a challenge. Um, uh, there's a lot you need to do. Um, at the same time, you know, um, if you've got Parkinson's, you've been dealt a bad card, you know, a bad hand of cards. And what I am saying here today is that instead of relying on your doctor to give you more pills, you can take matters into your own hands and do yourself a tremendous favor by faithfully exercising. And the three times 30 minutes is something you that we often recommend, but that you might as well forget at the same time. I tell all my patients that they should exercise every day. And the reason I'm saying every day is that if you exercise three times a week, there's always tomorrow. If you have to exercise every day, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. And if you do that with snacks or six times five minutes, or simply climbing stairs, leaving your car at home and taking the bicycle, taking a regular walk every day, 150 minutes per week is doable. And if you've got Parkinson's, if I would have had Parkinson's, I would be extremely motivated to do it. And yes, you know, I realize it's an intense regime. Strength exercise uh, plus 150 minutes of, you know, uh, uh, other exercises. But the people I see in my clinic, the people sitting at the other end of the desk who are doing best are the people who exercise on a regular basis. I know this disease inside and out. I see patients every week. And setting apart all the trials and the evidence that I mentioned, just from my own experience in clinical practice, the people who exercise are the ones who are doing best. And it's, it's a matter of incorporating this into your daily routine. So not three times a week, but every day. And by simply thinking about exercise with everything you do, I think 150 minutes per week should be doable, plus a bit of strength training. Um, and, you know, I'm a former athlete myself. And I enjoy it so much that I can't wait to begin my next exercise again. So the better, the fitter you become, the nicer it becomes to exercise and then it becomes more motivating. Okay, Bill Bucklew. Hi, Bill. Nice to uh, virtually meet you here. Uh, when considering the two factors in exercise, you spoke about uh, duration or volume and intensity. Do we have any idea what the relative impact or the synergistic effects are? Uh, the short answer is no, I don't. Uh, people have studied this separately uh, and not really as an interaction effect. I think the two effects are likely to be independent and additive, maybe even synergistic. But the honest answer is, I don't know. Uh, but I would recommend everyone listening to at least do the volume component if you find high intensity exercise difficult. And if you can do high intensity or moderate intensity exercise, the dose matters to combine the two. Uh, and he says, as a corollary, is there a limit? I'm referring to limits on brain health only why, uh, with this question, as I'm aware that physically and otherwise there will be limitation. 
or diminishing returns uh, with the amount or volume of exercise. So is there, this is a difficult question, Bill. Next time, <laughs> phrase it so an average Dutch person can read it. So are there diminishing returns with the amount or volume of exercise? He's asking whether, is there a point where you're doing so much that actually the ah. additional hour you do that week has no longer the same impact as ah. the first hour? Yeah, yeah. I, I haven't seen any studies where it plateaued. Um, so the more the better. The only thing that I do know, but these are anecdotes of some people who started to run marathons every day and who worsened and some of them never got back to normal. Now, it might be that these people had a genetic form of Parkinson's that affected their mitochondria, the respiratory organs of the brain cells. And if you overdo your exercise, you might deplete your body from ATP, the body's energy mechanism, and maybe even kill nerve cells. So uh, the dose matters. I haven't seen plateau studies, but people who were excessively overdoing it, again, running a marathon every day, there are anecdotes of people worsening, so don't over overdo it. Um, Scott Henley says, I reversed all my symptoms to zero through cognitively intense exercise. Well, that's beautiful, Scott. That reminds me of the study we did with treadmill training combined with cognitive training. And I've definitely had people, you know, I, I run into meetings with people and they say, I met you eight years ago, Professor Bloom. You told us to exercise. I started to exercise, I, I'm now better than eight years ago. I mean, I, I have many, many of these anecdotes. Uh, Man says, what do you think of vitamin B1 supplementation? Um, that I'm not in, uh, in, a favor, in favor of. What you should have checked on an annual basis, according to the latest guidelines, is vitamin B12. Uh, levodopa can lead to vitamin B12 deficiency. And vitamin B12 deficiency, in turn, is the factor that may lead to atheros atherosclerosis, which then, in turn, may lead to cardiac infarctions or strokes. So B12 should be checked and supplemented if reduced. And so does vitamin D for Dirk or David. So those two need to be checked and supplemented if needed. If you have a good regular diet, you should be OK. But because of levodopa, uh, you may run into B12 deficiency. And for some reasons that we don't fully understand, people with Parkinson's have a higher risk of a vitamin D for David deficiency. So have those two ones checked. And they can actually lead to sometimes good improvements if you supplement it. Um, so I've answered that one. Uh, is the app um, uh, being developed? Uh, will it easily be available to patients with Parkinson's? This is a question by Vicky. And uh, Vicky, the, the, the app is still only available in our trial um, because we want to um, do the study first and build up the evidence. Uh, once the app has been definitively proven to be efficacious, it will obviously be made available at no cost uh, to anybody with Parkinson's. So hold your horses for a little more until we've completed our trial. Um, what do you advise uh, uh, PD people with uh, joint issues or dystonia to get up their heart rate vigorously? Um, that's, that's again a good question. The, the best advice would be to go see your physiotherapist or sports trainer and find something, because these people are really good, you know, and, and, and find a, an individually tailored exercise that matches your abilities. Um, again, people with, you know, the, the person with the uh, uh, bad knees, a hand bicycle can be a solution. Um, and um, uh, uh, the, the dystonia is a whole separate issue because dystonia in Parkinson's is not as uncommon as people think, but dystonia is treatable, sometimes with levodopa, sometimes with botulinum toxin, sometimes with deep brain stimulation. Um, so I would have the, the, the dystonia treated um, first if that interferes with your exercise. Um, Kimberly Campanella says, I'm slightly frustrated as I'm exercising six to seven days per week, all sorts of things, but I'm getting, uh, still getting gait issues. Uh, she's a young onset uh, person uh, at the age of 41. Any advice? Um, well, Kimberly, you know, 
you're doing all the right stuff and I would encourage you to keep it up. Uh, unfortunately, I think what exercise is doing at this point is slowing down disease progression. I don't think for all patients it's halting disease progression altogether. And I, I'm with you. I understand. I'm, I, you have my sympathy. I, I, <clears throat> Parkinson's is a progressive disease. You are doing great stuff with your daily exercise. And if you hadn't exercised so vigorously, I will tell you, Kimberly, you would be way worse than you are now. Um, keep exercising to slow down your disease progression as much as possible. You're young. We're working hard every day on finding improved treatments, whether this be lifestyle interventions with diet or stress or other exercise regimes, or perhaps pills that may slow down the progression. And again, I hope that during my lifetime, you know, I'm an optimist, that we will find that treatment that will slow down your disease, maybe even stop the symptoms from progressing or maybe reverse the symptoms. But keep yourself as fit as possible until that day arrives. And uh, I wish we could stop Parkinson's altogether, um, but we can't right now. But you're still doing a great job. And keep it up, please. Uh, Irene Treacy says, excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Well, you're welcome. Uh, have you heard of smoothie vibration therapy? Um, I, I, I've heard of vibration therapy. Uh, we're actually engaging in a trial uh, here at my center, and there are other centers also doing vibration therapy. Um, I'm not convinced yet. I've seen spectacular results, uh, but that could well have been a placebo response. Uh, Parkinson's is one of the most placebo sensitive conditions on the planet because the placebo effect is mediated through dopamine. So if, if you tell in a very persuasive way that eating horse shit is good for Parkinson's, some people will benefit, no doubt, uh, particularly if I tell you, um, but that doesn't mean it works. Um, I think there is no convincing evidence for vibration therapy. Uh, I've seen encouraging case reports, and I think we need more evidence. So I wouldn't recommend people to purchase any vibration therapies unless they are eager to do so themselves and to wait for the evidence. Uh, Paul Nichols, hi Paul. Paul says, good evening, boss. Fantastic presentation. You're welcome. I'm the founder of Walking Football in the UK. Brilliant. We now have 14 centers delivering uh, walking football in the UK uh, and have a Gloucester hospital looking uh, to start a research study on why it is so effective. Uh, do you know if there's been any study into walking football or why moving a ball is so effective? Well, I've seen videos, Paul, and I'm a great fan of walking football. I love it. I'm a fan of sports in general, football in particular. And of course, I love English football, although I hope that the Dutch will beat the shit out of the English at the Europe, at the World Championships, uh, and also the French for that matter, um, uh, uh, in the World Championships that are about to come, the orange machine. Um, I don't think that walking football is unique in that it combines, but it, what, what it nicely combines, like boxing, is the movement, which is good, and it's externally driven because you need to follow the ball. And internally generated movements are defective in Parkinson's. The automatic pilot is damaged. Um, so any externally driven movement is easier for people with Parkinson's compared to internally driven movements. So that's why I think football is such a good exercise, like boxing, uh, because it's externally driven and it combines movement with following the ball. Uh, I would love to see the evidence coming out. I can already predict it's better than doing nothing. Um, um, uh, uh, and, and who knows, you, you might persuade me to enjoy a, a good game of walking football one day. Um, Steph Cockerell, I feel so hopeful now. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Steph. I take no medication. I was only diagnosed in February. I'm only 49. I sometimes struggle on Peloton. Peloton is a fancy exercise bicycle. As can't move the legs fast enough to raise the heart rate. Well, there you go, Steph. Maybe it's not your legs that are causing the problem. Maybe it's your heart. Um, and you don't need to worry about your heart, but instead dose your exercise based on your breathing pattern. Any advice for improving leg strength? Um, also, can we get involved in your step trial? So a couple of things. 
don't dose your exercise based on your heart rate, but tailor it to your breathing. Start panting, but still be able to maintain a conversation. Uh, that's one. Um, strength can be increased with strength training in the gym. Uh, and any uh, physio or sports trainer will be able to help you out to train your quads and your hamstrings and your calf muscles. So weakness is part of the Parkinson um, issue. Probably your legs are strong enough. I think your heart rate is not going up because of this Parkinson-related issue. So, so maybe it's not your strength, but maybe you have a sports trainer uh, look at it. Um, our exercise trial, the stepwise study, uh, is running in the Netherlands. So we're only including Dutch patients at this point. The uh, slow speed study is in the prodromals. So this is only for people who haven't had a diagnosis yet. Um, so, but that will be starting anytime soon. Uh, any views on the benefits of intermittent fasting combined with exercise is questioned by Eamon. Uh, no evidence, Eamon. Um, there's actually a bit of evidence, but not much on intermittent fasting. I've seen a few studies, but it's not at the level yet where I would prescribe it as a physician. I think there's some encouraging early evidence, uh, but not enough to prescribe it as a physician, let alone about the interaction. Um, the one study that I mentioned um, uh, that looked at both diet and exercise found these to be independent effects, which I personally find encouraging that uh, both diet and exercise are good. And that if you do both, the effects uh, sum up. So, uh, but whether this, the, 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 if you adhere to diet, I think the evidence is best for a Mediterranean diet, a few cups of coffee, uh, avoiding milk products or excessive milk products, spreading your proteins across the day and avoiding peaks in proteins and eating organic as much as you can. Because for those of you who follow my work, I'm very, very worried about pesticides as a cause of Parkinson's. Pesticides, according to recent work, may even accelerate disease progression if you already have Parkinson's. So try to avoid exposure to pesticides by eating organic or washing your fruit and veggies as carefully as possible. So Jasmine uh, Garsha says, in addition to aerobic exercise and strength training, what complementary therapies, physio, massage, acupuncture, do you recommend as the most beneficial? Or is it most based on individuality and what is relief is found from? Um, so Jasmine, I don't like the term complementary therapies. I'm a very holistic thinker, as you may have gathered from my presentation. Uh, I don't think it is regular versus complementary. It's all treatment. It's all on a continuum. And the continuum is not so much determined whether it's complementary or regular, but it's about the level of evidence. And there's simply better evidence for levodopa than there is for yoga or mindfulness. Or um, if I could, I could probably or probably should do a whole separate lecture here on my vision about complementary therapies or holistic medicine or integrative medicine. Uh, but uh, the one element in addition to diet and uh, exercise that I would like to pick out is anything that alleviates stress is crucial. So I'm a strong believer in yoga and mindfulness, and there is good evidence to support yoga and mindfulness. Uh, stress worsens symptoms in Parkinson's uh, in, the, in the short term. And there is some careful evidence, including new work by my own group, that chronic stress may accelerate disease progression. So conversely, mindfulness may slow down disease progression. That remains to be studied. I am a believer. So the package in my team is exercise, diet, and anything that reduces stress. Um, and there's a whole range of other things, uh, but that's for a separate you know, talk. Um, Frank says, what's your opinion on the ketogenic diet? The ketogenic diet is not an easy diet to adhere to. There are some reports that have mentioned a beneficial effect of the ketogenic diet, but these were not particularly well designed. And I think there is at best hints that it may be effective, um, but I'm not prescribing the ketogenic diet yet um, uh, because the, there's not enough evidence for its efficacy. Um, and it's not easy to adhere to. So I'm not, I'm not prescribing it yet. Um, next question by Mariette Robijn uh, from the Netherlands. Hi, Mariette. 
nice to see you. And uh, she says, dankjewel, which is Dutch for thank you. Graag gedaan, which is you're welcome. Very motivating talk. Now, my question is about do the exercise you like. After 10 years of Parkinson's and now running our own Parkinson's sports club, I think it would be a relief for many people to recognize that exercise is not always fun. Training for an Olympic medal is not always fun, I guess. The, there simply is a part of exercise that is not fun. The bit that is fun is your long-term goal. And that is exactly right. You know, uh, Mercuriale said it. Um, exercise comes with a bit of pain. Um, I'm not always enjoying myself on the treadmill or the exercise bicycle. I do it because of the happy feelings, the endorphins immediately after the exercise. And what should really motivate people is my conviction. And I'm 100% convinced that if you regularly exercise, your future will be better. So please adhere to your exercise, even if the workout itself isn't always pleasant. Think of the dot on the horizon and you will be better with exercise down the road if you do it now. John Palmieri, uh, thank you for the amazing talk. I noticed that in the Van der Kolk 2009 study, that was the gamified home-based exercise study with stationary bicycles. There were a few participants that did not respond well to the bicycling intervention. So do you have any insight in what determines whether someone is a responder or a non-responder? Well, John, that's a brilliant question. It's a $10 billion question. If I could answer it now, I would probably not be here, but I would be in Stockholm collecting my Nobel Prize. The honest answer is I don't know. What I do know is that this is the next level of research. Uh, we talk about personalized medicine with drugs. We try to tailor the drugs to your personalized DNA profile. But I think we should also begin to learn and understand why some people respond to exercise and others don't. I predict it relates to polymorphisms, changes in your DNA, your genetic profile for neural growth factors. So people who have a genetic profile that allows them to build growth factors more readily than others may respond better to exercise, but that's just an educated guess. It needs to be researched and it's on our list. So to be, to be determined. Mary Burton, who's a physiotherapist, are you going to compare live running in nature with virtual reality? Now that's a really cool study, Mary. Um, uh, if I had the funding, I would do the study tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would predict that running outside is at least as good as treadmill combined with virtual reality. Um, we're not planning to do it. I don't have the funding for it, um, but I would love to see the result. But my prediction is that running outdoors is at least as good, if not better, than uh, maybe also because of the oxygen levels, et cetera, and much more versatile. And Marietta Robijn says, we climb trees in the Netherlands. Um, I'll take that for granted. Uh, some of us do, Marietta. <laughs> It's been a while since I last climbed a tree, I have to say. Uh, Irene says, uh, neuroscientist Andrew Humberman did an excellent podcast on alcohol and alcohol. Uh, the outcome is that alcohol is really damaging the brain. So Irene, that is very much in line with what I said. Uh, one study showing that moderate alcohol consumption uh, was beneficial. Excessive should be avoided altogether. And again, I, I think the, the literature is biased towards the more positive studies. And I agree that alcohol overall is probably uh, not good for your brain. Uh, if you do take it, do it modestly and enjoy it. Uh, David Martin says, uh, are exercises that involve impact better than say swimming as they might help to maintain bone density? God, these questions are really good. You know, we have an educated audience here and I'm enjoying the questions. Uh, not been studied specifically, uh, but I would absolutely concur that um, this is on the one hand uh, better um, uh, because yes, people with Parkinson's are at risk for losing their bone density um, because of their inactivity, but also because of the vitamin D deficiency that we talked about earlier. So again, have your vitamin D controlled on an annual basis. Um, and yes, putting strain on your bones helps to maintain bone density. So in that regard, um, it's better than swimming. Quick word about swimming. We published a paper about near drowning. People with Parkinson's have an re increased risk of drowning. And one reason is that swimming 
requires a complex synchronization of arm movements and leg movements. That depends on the spinal pattern generator. That spinal pattern generator is also defective in Parkinson's. So people sink down to the bottom of the, of the swimming pool and are at risk of, of drowning. So if you consider swimming, tell your swimming instructor first that you've got Parkinson's and let them supervise you carefully. And I think some form of supervision will always be helpful if you are a swimmer with Parkinson's. Uh, anonymous attendee, does decaf coffee have the same positive effect as caffeinated coffee? It does not. It appears to be the caffeine. We don't fully understand why and how caffeine works for people with Parkinson's, but the caffeine definitely seems to be part of the trick. So decaf, no, uh, but if you enjoy decaf, do it. Uh, but three to four cups of real coffee uh, appears to be beneficial. Um, I'm, I'm looking at Michelle and Mark. I know we're, there's still 230. I, I was going to say, yes, it is. Basically, the questions are coming thick and fast. And actually, we are, we are, we are fighting a losing battle here. We, we stay stuck at the amount of like around 38, 40 questions. Um, I think that what I would suggest perhaps is that we just use maybe 15 minutes more, if that is okay for you, Bas. Well, well, we'll do 10 more, otherwise my wife- will That's exactly that, that that's I... exactly that. I was going to suggest yeah. that we basically focus on a few questions that would be the yeah. most interesting for people. Uh, let's just look at them together if you want. Um, sure, sure. Okay, we'll be quick and, and uh, it will not be the last time I'm doing a silver bullet no. talk, so I'll, I'll, I'll come we back. We spoke about vibration technology. That is already a topic you have touched on. Uh, exercise classes, I think that is general. The, the heart rate, we spoke a lot about that. Um, well, I'll, 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 yeah, you can remove questions that we've already had, and I'll, I'll just go from bottom to the. Uh, okay, so, perfect. and I'll, I'll focus on, on new people. So, Harry yes, Bates, um, exercise definitely will help, but eventually Parkinson's will progress. That's what we talked about earlier. The, the young onset lady who progressed despite uh, exercise. When the next breakthrough occurs in, this, in terms of disease modification, you would expect those already exercising to do better. So, yes, you know. We're, we're testing all sorts of drugs now to slow down Parkinson's. I think out of all the interventions that we're testing, exercise is closest to delivering the promise of being a disease modifying therapy. And if a drug arrives that slows down Parkinson's, I predict it will interact with exercise. So don't wait for the drug to arrive. Don't wait for the miracle therapy, but take matters into your own hands and exercise. Uh, the Stepwise app is not available yet. It's part of the trial, but as soon as the results come out, we will put the app freely out on the web. Um, should one focus on increasing VO2 max um, uh, uh, breath work before commencing exercise? Um, that I'm not entirely sure. If, if That's a question by David Martin. Um, so VO2 max was studied in our studies because it, it's a nice sort of intermediate objective quantitative outcome to prove that people were complying with the exercise. Um, yes, I would do it because when I went to the gym and I started to doing aerobic exercises, they did a VO2 max test to test my own personal you know, abilities. So if you want to have your customized, personalized, individualized regime, a, a VO2 max test at the outset might be helpful. David is also asking, does a rowing machine help to maintain arm actions while some swing may be absent in normal walking? Um, I like the rowing because rowing combines arm and leg movements. So it's much like a total body workout. I don't think it will restore arm movements in all fairness because that is, the arms are not weak. It's the automatism. It's the um, uh, it's the it's the it's the the it's the the movement pattern that's defective in Parkinson's, and you're not going to cure that with rowing. But rowing is a brilliant exercise for many other reasons. I think uh, uh, Bas, if you don't, if you allow me to just read the question, it will be quicker. A uh, question okay. from Adrian, who is asking: Are there any exercises specifically to help with freezing? Um, not specifically to alleviate freezing. Um, I think if you have a lot of freezing, um, um, then obviously regular walking might be difficult or frustrating, uh, but some people with freezing can still run on the treadmill, partially because running is different motor program, 
partially also because the treadmill acts as a tactile cue. Uh, but many people with freezing can still ride a bicycle. So for those folks, cycling on a stationary bicycle is an excellent solution. Someone is asking about infrared and near infrared therapy, which is entirely different from the topic of today. But do you have a view on the, those uh, new technologies? I don't think there's any robust evidence for uh, any of those therapies. Not that I'm aware of. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but it didn't catch my eye. So it's not not a not a good evidence based uh, intervention. I think. Thank you very much. I think that I'm looking very quickly at the remaining questions. I think that we basically. What I would suggest actually, Bas, is maybe that we, we do stop here because the questions are still coming in. We have covered a lot of the topics that I think you uh, come up reg regularly in those questions. Um, what I do want to say is a, is a huge thank you for your time today because I know that you're a very busy man and uh, I can't believe how lucky we were today to have so much of your time. Uh, I also would like to say a big thank you for dedicating your career to helping, pe to helping people like all of us on the line here. Uh, manage our symptoms better and maybe find new therapies that will help us go through this uh, condition better. So thank you ever so much for this and to congratulate you again for your Stephen Premi Award, which is an amazing reward and recognition of your, your work in the Netherlands and globally. So thank you ever so much, uh, Professor Bloom, for your time today. Uh, I will send you the, the, the transcript of the, the questions uh, so that you can basically have a look at them afterwards. And if you don't mind sending Mark and I the copy of the PDF version uh, of your slides, uh, I will share them with the audience. Absolutely. And then they will also have the references, which was one of the questions. Um, and um, yeah, no, that's totally fine. And uh, I hope uh, that people enjoyed it and, um, and are motivated um, to you know, engage in regular exercise. And um, um, that would, uh, you know, I've dedicated my life to helping people with Parkinson's and um, I'm convinced that exercise is one of my best ways to, to, to help you folks. So thank you for showing up in such large numbers. It's a privilege <laughs> and um, stay healthy and um, see thank you, you at some later occasion. See you soon. Thank you very much, Professor Bloom. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you.